Hi, I'm Anthony DiStefano, and today I'm in the town of Positano on the unbelievably gorgeous Amalfi Coast. The Amalfi Coast is a little stretch of shoreline on the southern coast of Italy, right on the Mediterranean Sea. And you've got to believe me when I tell you that it is one of the most beautiful places on the face of the earth. It's got everything. Spectacular steep cliffs, cobalt blue water that sparkles in the sun, lush gardens, pebbly beaches, and the most colorful, picturesque little towns you've ever seen with hotels and villas built right into the hillsides. The famous towns on the coast and nearby, Salerno, Amalfi, Ravello, Sorrento, and of course, the amazing Isle of Capri off the coast of Naples, all have charming shops and winding streets and cafes and restaurants with terraces that overlook the sea. And all around you, the air is filled with the fragrance of lemons. It's really something. And that's why we're starting our program here. Because today, we're going to talk about what heaven is going to look like. Will it really be cloudy and white like it's usually portrayed in the movies? Or is it going to be full of vibrant colors and incredibly beautiful things to see, like this place? We'll discuss that question and much more on this episode of A Travel Guide to Heaven. This is a special pre-boarding announcement. All passengers traveling to our final destination today have been awarded a lifetime's worth of frequent flyer miles, entitling them to automatic upgrades to first class. Since the flight is very full, we ask that you check the following items at the gate. Gloominess, stuffiness, cynicism, pessimism, intellectual snobbery, self-righteousness, and prejudice against God and religion. Please be assured you can retrieve this property upon your return, if you wish. Let's say you wanted to take a special anniversary vacation with your spouse and money was no object. I know that if my wife and I were taking such a trip to, say, California, and I had an absolutely unlimited budget, I might have a limousine drive us to the airport, or a private jet would be waiting for us right there on the runway. When we landed in Los Angeles, another limo would take us straight to some swanky place like the Beverly Hills Hotel, where I would treat my wife to a bottle of champagne and maybe some caviar in the polo lounge before checking into, you guessed it, the presidential suite. And that would just be the start. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating such delicious decadence on a daily basis. But the question that comes to mind is this. If we would gladly treat ourselves and our families to the best first class service on a simple trip to some resort in the U.S., what kind of magnificent accommodations is God going to provide for us when we travel to his own resort, heaven? And even more importantly, what kind of personal arrangements is God planning for us? What are we going to look like when we get to heaven? What sort of people are we going to be? Well, the first thing to understand is that the person who will hopefully be in heaven at the end of time is you. Not some angel, not some disembodied spirit, not some unemotional spiritual copy of yourself that hardly resembles the person you know at all. If you're in heaven after the general resurrection, you'll be there as a whole person, soul and body. Justin Martyr, writing a little more than 100 years after Christ's own bodily resurrection, summed it up perfectly. If God has called humans to life and resurrection, he's called not a part but a whole, and that is the soul and the body. The question is, what are we going to be like once we're whole again in heaven? Common sense tells us that if God went through the trouble of making us, he's not simply going to throw us away. He's going to change us, certainly. We won't be exactly the same in heaven as we are right now. In fact, these changes will be both dramatic and exciting, and they're going to make our life in heaven a lot more interesting. But in another very real way, our resurrected bodies will be strikingly similar to what we have now. To start with, our bodies are going to be made up of some kind of matter, some version of atoms and molecules and cells. How do we know that? Because that's what a body is. That's what makes it different from a spirit. It's not a spirit because it has mass and weight and form. Tertullian, another famous Christian theologian, wrote about this in 210 AD, 
saying that our bodies will rise again and they will be certainly the same flesh and certainly in its entirety. Because we'll have human bodies in heaven, we'll also be able to do all the things we do right now. We'll be able to use our senses, for example. We'll be able to eat in heaven, drink in heaven, and talk in heaven. We'll be able to see, hear, run, and whistle a tune. People in heaven will be able to sit in a chair and read a book. They'll be able to hug one another. They'll be able to snap their fingers, brush their hair, take a long walk, or create a work of art with their hands. Our bodies won't just stop acting like human bodies just because they're in heaven. They also won't stop being our bodies. You're not going to stop being you when you get to heaven. You're not going to be someone else. You're going to have your mind, your memories, your consciousness. Yes, you'll be free of all the worries and pains associated with our earthly journey, but you're still going to be you. Whatever makes you the person that you are is what you're going to keep in heaven. The point is that people don't lose their identity when they go to heaven. They don't somehow get a case of amnesia. And by the way, when I say people don't lose their identity, that includes their physical identity as well. If you want to get some idea of how you might look in heaven, go take a look in the mirror. Now don't get worried about what I'm saying. I can just hear some people screaming, I hate the way I look now. I don't want to look this way in heaven. What if there are some things about your body that you want to change, that you need to change if you're going to be happy in heaven? Do I mean you have to stay exactly the way you are now for all eternity? Absolutely not. Listen, you just have to trust God a little bit. He knows better than you what's wrong with your body and how it needs to be fixed so that you'll be happiest in heaven. Do not be anxious, Christ said, if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, men of little faith? And Augustine, one of the greatest Christian theologians in history, called God a wonderful artisan who would undoubtedly restore our bodies back to life and take care that nothing unseemly result. Just because you're going to keep your identity in heaven doesn't mean you're going to be exactly the same. There are going to be outrageous differences that only God could think up. The key word in this whole discussion is identity. Who are you really, physically, psychologically, and emotionally? Maybe you might respond, I'm outgoing, I'm generous, I'm adventurous, I'm pretty. Or you might have traits you wish you could change, and so you'd say, I'm lazy, I'm overweight, I'm angry, I'm depressed, I'm undisciplined. Well, do you really believe that you're equal to those negative characteristics? Is that who you are at your core? Is that your identity? In most cases, the answer is no. Come on. Those are imperfect qualities that you've acquired over time because of a genetic predisposition or from your environment or from your bad choices and habits. But they're not part of your true identity. And because of that, they have no place in heaven. You'll be able to say goodbye and good riddance to them once you leave this life. On the other hand, what about the real you? Can we even know what that is? Listen, have you ever had a day in your life when everything was going right, when you could do no wrong? Try to seriously recall a time when you were at your absolute peak, when you were acting, thinking, and feeling your best, a day when you were entirely enthusiastic and energized and passionate. A day when you were at your maximum level of performance psychologically and emotionally. Have you ever had a day like that? When you were truly being the kind of person you know you have the power to be? Everyone has experienced a few days like these. Most of us don't have them as often as we wish. In fact, very few of us live up to our full potential all the time. But we do a occasionally hit our stride, so to speak, and are able to show the world and ourselves what we're really made of. It's at those times that we're able to see a glimpse of our true identity. That's the identity that God always sees in us. It's what he had in mind when he created us. That's more of what we'll be like in heaven. The same goes for our physiology. If you're 72 years old now and are watching this show, 
I don't have to tell you that your identity is not 72. On the inside, you know that you're still 25, isn't that right? Time may have unfairly rocketed you to your present age, and your body may have suffered in the process, but that doesn't change the fact that in your essence, you're still the same person you were 50 years ago. I don't have to tell you that it's not your identity to be obese, nor is it your identity to be crippled, or deformed, or diseased, nor blind or deaf. None of those things makes up the core person of who you really are. The simple point is that when you enter heaven, you will enter as your truest self, your best being emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, and physically. Whoever that is, and only God knows for sure, is who you're going to be in heaven. In some cases, we're going to see people in heaven who look pretty much the same as they did on earth. In some cases, they'll be younger. In some cases, older. In some cases, thinner. No matter what the change is, though, one thing is certain. We'll be able to identify the people we knew and loved in life. How will you recognize your grandfather who died at 87 if in heaven he looks as young and vibrant as he was at 30? Well, he might just have to introduce himself to you at first. You may need a little time getting used to seeing him as a young man. Or God may simply give you the ability to immediately see him for who he is. No one can say for sure how God will work all his miracles. But there is no question that we will recognize our grandfather as our grandfather, our grandmother as our grandmother, our children as our children. And that's not even the best part. God has other exciting changes in store for us as well. In fact, he's gone out of his way to tell us exactly what those changes are and demonstrate them to us with a living, breathing example. We see at the end of all the gospel accounts a stunning description of what Christ was like after his bodily resurrection. Even if you're not a Christian, it's fascinating to read what the Bible says about this because it provides us with a glimpse of how we're going to act, live, and be in heaven. The passages I'm referring to center around the various appearances Christ makes to his disciples after he's crucified and then rises from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. It's almost eerie to see how Christ is suddenly present in a room one moment and then disappears into thin air, how he's able to move silently through walls and ascend into the sky, how he has the power to let himself be recognized or not by the people around him. At the very same time that he's showing his power over physical laws in the material universe, he's eating fish with his disciples, having conversations with them, and making them touch his body to show them that he's real and not some phantom. What God has done in these short paragraphs is pull back the veil of secrecy that shrouds heaven and reveal, just for a brief moment, what life there is going to be like. As St. Paul said when describing our life in the world to come, Christ will change our lowly body to be like his glorified body. Theologians have analyzed the post-resurrection appearances of Christ and drawn many implications and conclusions about the nature of the risen body. Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic saint and philosopher of the 13th century, listed four distinct qualities that our bodies will have in heaven, qualities that mirror what Christ displayed in the Bible. Subtlety which is the ability to pass through even solid material, agility, the ability to move anywhere just by thinking it, impassibility, which means freedom from all suffering, and clarity, which is the light or glory of the sanctified soul, which is somehow reflected in the glorified body. What it all comes down to is a basic transformation of how your body operates. Right now, your physiology greatly impacts how you act and what you do. If you're hungry, for example, you eat. If you're thirsty, you drink. If you're tired, you sleep. You can fight against your body, of course, but eventually you have to lose. Everyone has heard the expression, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know this is true. In a million different ways, we're slaves to our bodies. Some individuals more so than others. When we see people who have no ability to discipline their physical desires and related emotions, we say they have no self-control or willpower. 
Sometimes this inability can wreak havoc in our lives. For example, we know we shouldn't eat all that ice cream and fast food, but we just can't resist. So we end up with heart disease. We know we should exercise every day, but our bodies are just too tired from the pressures of work. So we watch TV instead and wind up with extra pounds and no energy. Or even more disastrously, we know that we should be faithful to our spouse, but we just can't seem to control our sex drive. So we start a mindless affair that eventually leads to divorce. So many lives, so many families, so many marriages have been destroyed because our will is often subservient to our bodily cravings and so obviously need to be perfected. Fortunately, when we get to heaven, a startling reversal takes place. Our bodies will essentially become subservient to our wills and our wills perfectly conformed to the will of God. What that means is that in heaven, we'll no longer be plagued by any of the unhealthy compulsions and unethical, unintelligent habits that drive our behavior right now. We won't have any vices or bad habits. We'll finally be in total command of our actions and behavior. At last, we'll be able to live at our full potential. The really exciting thing, though, is that when God says our bodies will be at the absolute service of our wills, he means absolute. The implications for us are staggering. Imagine for a second that you have 100% control over your body. Imagine you can tell it to do anything you like and it will listen. In heaven, the body is going to have the power to do whatever we tell it to do and go wherever we tell it to go instantaneously. Right now, for instance, I'm standing in front of a video camera. But after I'm finished, I would love to be in Rome, sitting in an open air cafe on the Via Veneto, or maybe skiing in the Swiss Alps, or maybe taking a leisurely stroll down the Champs Elysees in Paris, or who knows, maybe even playing golf on the moon. Obviously, this is just wishful thinking. But in heaven, it will be reality. In heaven, the body is going to have the power to listen to those kinds of commands. I know that might seem too incredible to believe, but that's what our Christian faith teaches about the power of our glorified bodies. All of this should give you at least some idea of what you're going to look like and be like in heaven. But before we discuss the activities we're going to enjoy in the afterlife, we need to explore the terrain a little bit. What exactly are the sights to see on this eternal vacation? Let's think about what this strange place actually looks like. The good news is that we actually have a picture of it. As a matter of fact, we've had it for 2,000 years. It's right there in scripture and Christian theology. All we have to do is take the time to make some basic theological deductions and perhaps use a little bit of our God-given imagination. For example, people think of heaven as something so far off, so unclear and hazy that they can't focus on it. They don't realize that what they're looking for might be right under their nose. Did you know that? If you want some kind of idea of where heaven is, don't strain your eyes looking high up into the sky. It's not beyond the stars or over any rainbow. It's right here under our feet. Many theologians believe that after the general resurrection, the physical location of heaven will be earth. In the New Testament, there is much talk of a new heaven and a new earth. What this simply may mean is that in the same way human beings are destined to experience death, bodily resurrection, and transformation, so too might our own planet. God may use the same pattern and the same model that he uses for us on earth. You see, if God is anything, he's consistent. Since he's already shown us that he intends to make use of the raw material of human beings in heaven, then you can be sure that he's going to continue to use the raw material of the world around us. God's not going to waste anything he spent so much time and effort creating. He's already said that his creation is good, and he means it. But like human beings, the earth itself is going to experience a death and resurrection of sorts. Scripture teaches us that the world we're living in now will come to an end one day. It will die, just as human beings must die. We call that event the apocalypse. But afterwards, after the destruction of the old world, there's going to be a new one. 
the Earth we live on now is going to undergo a stunning, spectacular transformation. This new transformed Earth will form part of what we call heaven. Now, what exactly will this place look like? Try putting on your Sherlock Holmes theological hat for a second. Is there the slightest doubt, for example, knowing what we know about God and how he operates, that heaven is going to be lit up in bright, vivid technicolor? Can anyone seriously believe that heaven is going to be all cloudy and white like we see it portrayed in the movies? In heaven, we'll certainly see the basic colors, but we'll probably also see new ones that we've never even imagined. There's a famous quote from the Bible that says, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the minds of man what God has prepared for those who love him. We have to take that statement from St. Paul very literally. Heaven is going to be a feast for the senses. And this feast will by no means be restricted to the sense of sight. Do you think you've tasted some good food in your life? Well, wait until you taste the food in heaven. Not only will you be able to eat the familiar foods you had on earth, but there will be new ones to try, brand new flavors and brand new tastes. Do you think you've heard some pleasing sounds in your life? Is there a particular kind of music that always puts you in a good mood or makes you feel incredibly happy? Well, heaven is going to have music too. And I guarantee you, it won't be just choirs singing and harps playing. You'll be able to experience all the good and inspiring kinds of music you know and love now, and new and unimaginable kinds as well. The same thing goes for our sense of smell and touch. In heaven, there'll be new scents and odors to enjoy and new textures and shapes to feel. Now, along with this whole new variety of sights, sounds, smells, and textures, we'll also probably see a whole new variety of created things. After all, if there's one conclusion you should be able to draw from this discussion, it's that God is an artist, a great artist. Just take a walk through any botanical garden or any good zoo, and you can see that God has an absolutely insatiable love for inventing the most amazing things. Sometimes, when we observe a particularly interesting looking creature, like an aardvark or sea walrus, you can almost hear God chuckling during the act of creation. God has a sense of humor and a flair for living that we just don't often give him credit for, and it's time that we started. I firmly believe that God is going to go on creating things forever. I think that heaven is going to be filled with all sorts of animals, vegetables, and minerals, the likes of which have never been seen. And by the way, we'll talk more about the possibility of animals in heaven in a later episode. Now, it would be a mistake, of course, to think of heaven as one colossal nature preserve. In the book of Revelation, which tells us what the future holds for the world, Part of heaven is called the New Jerusalem. The description provided by the Apostle John, who wrote the book at the end of the first century, is one of the most aesthetically sumptuous in the whole Bible. And I saw the holy city. Its radiance was like that of a precious stone, and it had a massive high wall with 12 gates where 12 angels were stationed. Even accounting for the symbolic language and poetry of the passage, it should be obvious that when John is describing our dwelling place in heaven, he's talking about a real, honest-to-goodness city, an amazingly vast city. And inside that city, there's no reason to believe that there won't be buildings and houses, and no reason to think that humans won't live in those houses. After all, if we're going to have our bodies in heaven, there are going to be times when we'll want to be inside instead of outside. Doesn't that make sense? What will these structures look like? Who knows? But if it's true that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God, then like God, some of the things we ourselves create in life may very well have value beyond the day to day. Think about this concept for a second. In building up our own cities, God may actually be allowing us in some mysterious way to build up heaven. That means that heaven may very well be, at least in part, made up of cities that we're already familiar with. Maybe we'll be able to see ancient Rome again, not in ruins, but clad in all its golden splendor. Or the pyramids and the Sphinx, just as they were on the day they were built. Or the Parthenon, with all its marble columns and statues intact. 
without their negative pagan influences, of course. Perhaps we'll be able to walk through the streets of old Paris, or Renaissance Florence, or, or, or the China of the Ming Dynasty. Likewise, ancient Greeks and Romans who rise from the dead on the last day may get to see the skyline of Manhattan. And yes, why couldn't it be true that in God's heaven, the World Trade Center will rise up again? Listen, I know all this seems incredible, but remember, heaven is incredible. That's what Christianity teaches. It's going to have incredible natural wonders as well as incredible cities. And believe me, we've only just begun talking about how wondrous it truly will be. We're here at the beautiful San Pietro Hotel in Positano having a wonderful lunch. And the reason why we end each program of the meal isn't just because we like to eat, which we do. It's because we want to make the point that heaven is not some cloudy, gray, boring place. It's a banquet, a feast. A feast with family and friends and music and life and laughter and an abundance of joy. In today's show, we talked a little bit about what we might be like in heaven and what heaven itself might look like. The next time we meet, we're going to discuss our fellow travelers, the other people in heaven, and the kind of relationships we might be able to have with them. Until then, this is Anthony DiStefano wishing you health and happiness and heaven too. Salute.